So, Professor. Yes, uh, we are going to start this uh, talk by Professor Khalid Khan, who is a very international renowned expert. He has earned many titles, like uh, he's been also a professor at the University of Amsterdam, since black professor at the UK Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists in London, or the Beatriz Galindo Distinguished Investigator at the University of Granada. He has been in qualified in several universities, like uh, McCaster in Canada, in Dundee, in Kay, or Daga Khan University in Karachi. And he's as a good researcher, but also a very good uh, educationalist in health. He's very good in disseminating all the knowledge and expertise he has, uh, as you will see. He's the lead author of uh, systematic reviews of support evidence-based medicine, which is a very, very well-awarded uh, book, and it's available in English, German, and Chinese. Uh, uh, Khalid also was the, is the former editor-in-chief of the British Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and many other journals. He has written hundreds of peer-reviewed papers, and for all of us, it's an enormous uh, honor to have him here in our seminar, and we need to read him. The session will be recorded for in case that anyone misses it, as it in my case that I'm currently in the car driving to Madrid, well, not driving, <laughs> but going to Madrid, we will be able to, to see it afterwards. So again, Professor Khan, thank you, thank you very much for your time and for sharing your expertise with all of us. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me. I'd like to share my screen so I can uh, share my slides with you. Let's see how that goes. Uh, it looks like we are okay. Can, can you confirm, can anybody in the audience confirm that? We are, are seeing, wait, we are my slides? seeing now, perfect. perfect. All right, thank you. So, the title of uh, the presentation I'm about to, to make is called Integrity in Conduct and Reporting of Biomedical Research. And uh, I'd like to start by first reminding you that if you have attended something on similar lines before, normally, the speaker would have started by telling you about historic tragedies and very likely they would have referred to the thalidomide disaster. Uh, this is uh, related to a marketed uh, drug that uh, when used by pregnant women led to the development of malformed limbs. And even today live many thousands of uh, people with these deformities. This was banned in the 1960s in most countries. Uh, it is very likely that you would also have been told about the syphilis experiments that were carried out can you imagine for 40 years, the last uh, that lasted until the 70s by the United States Public Health Service? I mean, these were not only unethical, but also racist experiments. And uh, it's now often presented as uh, the, the, the background under which the emphasis on informed consent was uh, developed. But look, all of this is history. What about today's world? Just think about the pandemic of COVID-19. We are still going through it as I speak. And I present to you a paper concerning this uh, problem. 
published in the New England Journal of Medicine by researchers uh, at, the, at the Harvard University, very well-renowned institution worldwide. Uh, it is probably difficult for any one of us to imagine that there could be a problem with this paper. Well, within a month of this paper being published, an expression of concern was published. So on the 1st of May, after this paper appeared, and on the 2nd of June, this expression appeared. And then this paper was retracted. So the subject we are talking about is not just a historical problem. It is alive and well in today's research world. And it affects the lives of all of us who are affected by the pandemic. And uh, if we look at the world and retracted papers. Here uh, we see a worldwide map and it shows different levels of retraction in different countries. But if we just focus our minds on the coronavirus, there have been over 100 papers retracted concerning this theme. So can you imagine that in the last year where uh, every month there have been more cases of infection, more deaths related to the infection and the condition has been spreading around and going around in waves after waves. There have been paper published and retracted Every month, there have been about eight to 10 papers retracted. Every week, there have been two papers retracted. Uh, this week started yesterday, and by the time it is completed on Friday, in four days, another two papers would have been retracted because of some error, some problem, some difficulty, some lack of integrity along the way in the process of publication. And because of this problem, you will find yourself, if you looked in the literature, to not be surprised that we are talking about medical misinformation in the published literature. And with this background, I welcome to you to my presentation about integrity in research conduct and reporting. My plan is to tell you a little bit about myself, then to give you an orientation about why it is important to focus on research that produces facts and avoid research that produces fake news, to uh, think about research as it relates to society not just as it relates to science. And then with respect to research integrity issues, I'd like to talk about the planning phase of research, the conduct, and then reporting of research before giving a summary. And uh, before I move on to give you a little bit more background about myself. May I just check if, if uh, all of you have heard what I said so far clearly. And if you have any questions, you may um, raise your hand or write something in the chat so I can see if there is any issue arising. You can even unmute your microphone and tell me if so far the presentation has been received at your end clearly. I, I, I'd like to hear at least a couple of people say something so that I can know that it's okay to proceed. 
So Javier says he received everything okay. Anybody else wishes to make a comment? Yes, here too. I can listen and I can see everything. Okay, thank you very much uh, for this reassurance. So with this, I move on. I'd like to tell you about my own uh, career. I started medical school in 1983 in uh, Pakistan. After completing medical school, I did some clinical training in Kenya. I returned to Pakistan, completed my fellowship in uh, women's health and then obtained training in uh, research in Canada. And then I spent about two and a half decades of my life working in the UK uh, in uh, various uh, universities. And then um, after taking a sabbatical in the University of Granada about three and a half, four years ago, last year I had the opportunity to move, uh, to move here. And if you look at my website, it will give you information uh, about other aspects of my career. I like to focus on my record as a researcher because it is this experience that gave me the knowledge of uh, integrity and and, and integrity in research and the importance of honesty um, in the whole of the research process. And I'm going to take you through this in the course of my presentation today. So my first paper was published soon after I returned from my first year working in Kenya to Pakistan. To tell you the truth, it is one of my very few papers that got accepted on submission to the first journal after one revision. Almost all of my papers have required very many submissions and very many revisions. I published my first systematic review after uh, my training uh, in Canada and uh, starting my career as a medic and a researcher uh, in the UK, which at that time was part of the European Union. Um, during my time in the UK, I had the opportunity to work as uh, a journal editor to write a book. And for several years, I was the chief editor of uh, this journal uh, at the right hand bottom of your screen. Uh, but during this time, I also had the opportunity to work as research and development director in two different hospitals. And during this, uh, these response, during the course of uh, delivering these responsibilities, I came across issues related to scientific misconduct, which I had to investigate. And uh, some of this experience will shape what I present to you today. During the course of my own work, I uh, published over 400 research articles. And here is uh, a graph of over 20,000 citations to my research articles. I was invited to present how to undertake research in many different countries, over 37 at last count, as shown in this graph in all Habit, inhabited continents of the world. And in this graph, I show you the number of participants per study. And uh, you can see that the number of participants vary from a few, for example, 
1993, a study with only 20 or 30 subjects, and to some studies with several thousand. For example, the one in 2008 with over 5,000. And uh, the most important thing I want to highlight to you in this graph is this orange or red line, which has nearly a million participants in all of my research. And I highlight this to you as the most important part of this slide, because for me, the science I have taken part in has, would not have been possible without the participation of people. And my science would have no value unless it had some potential to contribute to the lives of people. Uh, so for me, the important thing with respect to honesty and integrity in research is that what we do in research is about people and for people. And we're gonna cover that in, in the coming slides. And in the meantime, I wanna have a quick look at some comments that I hope people have made here. Uh, well, there is a confirmation that slides progressing fine. And uh, Javier has left. So thank you to him for making the introduction. At this stage, I also would like to ask if colleagues have any questions. If there are any questions, you can use the same format we used before. Feel free to use the chat or unmute your microphone and ask me a question. So we move on to the next aspect of my presentation, which is about an orientation concerning the difference between facts and fake news in science. So the important thing is to remember that it's not just politicians and people who create fake news. It's also scientists who, who have the ability to create fake news, either intentionally or if they are not careful, they could make honest errors that could create fake news. And it is important for us to remember that <clears throat> the knowledge that we have underpins our beliefs. So the level of confidence with which we possess knowledge allows us to use the knowledge to make decisions. And if the knowledge is correct, the belief based on this knowledge when used will reach well-informed decisions. On the other hand, if the knowledge that underpins the belief is incorrect, in fact, this knowledge based on, this belief based on incorrect knowledge is also usable and can lead to misinformed decisions. In the green part of this diagram, these decisions lead to benefits to patients, to society. On the other hand, the incorrect knowledge that underpins strong beliefs leads to harm. And if we have knowledge that may be correct or incorrect, but it has no impact on the belief system, in fact, it leads to ignorance, uh, which I suppose is neither beneficial nor harmful. But if you imagine that correct knowledge could in fact have been possessed with confidence leading to well-informed decisions, then in fact, you could say there is some harm 
arising from this aspect of knowledge that does not inform or underpin beliefs. So with correct knowledge, we have the chance to improve, but also with incorrect knowledge, uh, we in fact have the possibility to create beliefs that are dangerous. Keeping that in mind, we should focus on integrity and honesty in research. I take two more examples here about the importance of cre creating the correct facts so that beliefs can be modified through research. So on your right hand side of the screen is the gentleman related to an unwashed hand. And we'll come back to look at his story in a second. But the gentleman on the left hand side is associated with the discovery that the earth revolves around the sun and not the other way around, as was the belief over 350 years ago, where the common idea was that the earth is the center of the universe and the sun went around the earth. And you can see that uh, this system, this belief system change took a long time to be accepted as it is now the common belief. And it took until 1992 for the church to formally apologize to Galileo for not accepting the theory and observations that he put forward uh, so many years ago. But with respect to Simmelweis, his story is more recent. At his time, it wasn't known that bugs or germs caused infections. Today, in the World Health Organization, we see his statue, and uh, I had the privilege to take this photo that you see next to the World Health Organization logo. Myself, when I visited there on several occasions in the last decades, the belief system at this time was that bad air caused infection. He observed that in maternity wards manned by midwives, there were less deaths in mothers compared to midwifery wards manned by doctors. And he had also observed that doctors were performing dissections in dead bodies to learn about anatomy before entering labor wards to assist women giving birth. So with this observation, he introduced uh, lime juice water fluid for doctors to wash their hands before they entered the labor ward. And then guess what happened when hand washing started the mortality in the labor ward where doctors were delivering women in between performing dissection on dead bodies, that mortality rate went down to the same level as that of the midwives. You would have thought that this research would have been accepted immediately and practice would have changed, but this did not happen for a long time. In fact, Simmelweis was incarcerated in a psychiatric hospital for putting forward his thesis that uh, washing hands could reduce maternal mortality. Uh, although now we see that washing hands is the normal advice in any healthcare facility. In fact, it's normal advice for all human beings in the COVID pandemic era, 
uh, on a very regular basis. And we see Similwise appear in stamps and commemorative coins in uh, many circumstances. And a, and, and a question has come about in the chat. Thank you, uh, Daniela, for this question. You ask, could you explain the belief, uh, could you explain the concept of confidence? Do you mean the language or the tone of the article? Okay, thank you for asking this question. Uh, Daniela, I'll attempt to explain this. What I mean is that when knowledge appears in published articles or in a thesis uh, after experiments have been carried out, it takes a while for people to accept this knowledge as correct knowledge. And the, and the acceptance of this knowledge is what I refer to as confidence. And the acceptance of this knowledge and the confidence with which we accept this knowledge is what develops a belief system. And it is the belief system that allows us to take action. Just because knowledge exists does not automatically mean that it will lead to acceptance of this knowledge as a belief and doesn't also automatically mean that this correct knowledge will be transmitted into action in a healthcare system or in society in general. So this is what I mean by confidence. If we undertake research which has concerns about its integrity, the chances that such research will transmit confidence to the readers and then will become part of a belief system is low. So that's why I want to highlight right at the outset that our objective as researchers shouldn't be just to publish a thesis or a trabajo de fin de master or a publication in a journal but it should in fact be to contribute to knowledge in a manner that it will have an impact on the belief system. Does that make sense, uh, Daniela? Yes, it makes sense, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for confirming that. <clears throat> All right, we now turn to my way of thinking about research, I want to make this clear because there are many, many traditions of research. So here you see there is research going on at atomic, subatomic level, cellular, cellular system level, and organ system level. And often this is described as lab research. My presentation today focuses largely, almost entirely, on patient-centered research where people or groups of people take part in research. And the observations, observations made in these groups of people uh, are analyzed and results produced, and those results are then published or put forward for consideration by other scientists and by society at large. This type of research, if you think about it, the idea is that we move from lab to creating an impact in society. And you don't have to think too hard, just think about 
what happened in the last year? We faced something new that we did not know before. The coronavirus pandemic did not exist in our textbooks. It did not have previous knowledge underpinning what direct interventions could be used to make an impact. And guess where we are now after one year? The idea is that research should be making a health impact. So put the presentation I'm making to you today in the context of what has happened in the last year in our lives. The idea is that research should move to health impact. This, can, this is often also described as research translation. This journey of translation is not a straight line. In this journey, we frequently move through various types of studies. Different names are given to these types of studies, clinical efficacy studies or effectiveness studies. And these studies in terms of translation are described as T2 translation. There is a stage before this, which transmits uh, more basic lab research into clinical efficacy studies called T1. This T2 then moves into T3 or translation stage three, phase three, where evidence is synthesized in systematic reviews and meta-analyses, and then guidelines are produced. And this is called translation stage four. And the idea is that through all this, we can have through all these stages of translation, we can reach a health impact. And presumably many of you have come across all this through the terminology used in, uh, in uh, pharmacology. And I put this to you in context that phase one precedes clinical efficacy. Phase two is similar or overlapping with efficacy. Phase three is effectiveness. And phase four is phases related to implementation when a pharmaceutical product is being put into practice and is being monitored during its use. We take this, this, uh, this concept and idea forward. Uh, with this orientation, if you think about it, we need to do in the initial stages, pilot or feasibility or early studies. These involve a small number of patients per study. In clinical effectiveness or translation studies, we need large multi-center clinical trials. In fact, as we will all know from the pandemic vaccination research, we in fact need multi-country trials. So just one hospital, one city, one province, one country is not enough. Often this type of research involves studies across many different cultures, settings, continents, in order for us to be confident that what we are recommending is going to have an impact. And then when all of this research is available. It is synthesized and you may have come across a term called living systematic review or living guideline that as evidence becomes available, policy and guidance is updated. The important thing to recognize is that each next phase depends on the truthfulness, correctness, or honesty of the previous phase. So one might think that feasibility studies automatically lead to multi-center studies. Well, this is not always the case. It is possible that if there are issues about 
honesty, integrity, met methods, correctness, precision, or other aspects of initial studies, which may be discovered through systematic reviews or evaluations of those studies uh, in other formats, then we may have to keep on repeating those studies until we can be confident that we can move to the next phase. And the same applies to multi-center studies. If these studies are small, <clears throat> even when multi-center are not large or widespread across many centers or countries, then perhaps we may have to repeat those studies. And then it's only when we have definitive, honest, truthful, precise and reliable information that we have any hope of having a health impact. So honesty is fundamental to moving forward in making a health impact. With respect to honesty and integrity, here is a <clears throat> publication called Hong Kong Principles. And it takes us through various stages of research from question formulation, design, conduct, analysis, reporting, and dissemination. And it gives us specific elements of importance with respect to integrity. And from this infographic, I will take inspiration to take you forward in my presentation. I'd like to take a short break here to give you an opportunity to ask me any questions or make any comments as to what I have presented so far. Please feel free to write your comment in the chat or just unmute your microphone and uh, make your comment verbally. Professor? Yes, go ahead. Can you show me please uh, another time the, the previous uh, slide because I didn't uh, understood really well. Okay, no problem. Let me just find a way of getting back to my presentation. Is, is this the slide you're referring to? Yes, this one. No, the, the, the last one. This one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, please feel, please feel free to ask your question if you wish. Okay. Now, can you explain me another time this, uh, this slide? Uh? In terms okay. of look, look, all of the presentation that will follow will explain this slide and more. Uh, this I present to you at the beginning to simply highlight that the issue of integrity is throughout the process of research. And I will take you through each step during the course of my presentation. Okay, thank you. Okay, so unless there is any more question, I move to the next phase where I will talk to you about what research is about. Well, a healthcare practitioner, a clinician, a public health doctor, a health minister, all of us need access to science because of what we call evidence-based medicine. This allows us to use what is evidence in simple terms, evidence is stuff that is published in scientific journals or in scientific documents. And the information contained in these documents, the evidence can then be combined with other ideas that we have with respect to what we do in order to make decisions or policies. With respect to evidence-based medicine, there are four typical steps 
that are considered as the defining feature of evidence-based medicine. So these steps are framing the question, identifying the literature or the evidence, <clears throat> checking the evidence for validity or truthfulness. And if the evidence is truthful, then to put this into practice. So there is a great responsibility on the shoulders of scientists to produce evidence that is truthful because without it, evidence-based medicine will not work. Evidence-based decision-making will not work and evidence-based health policy will not work. Now I'd like to quickly take you through the clinical process, which to me is simple. We are presented with a problem. We have some prior knowledge about the problem. We then diagnose the problem to understand what is the prognosis. And once we know the prognosis, we try to change the prognosis by giving therapy. The knowledge requirements for each step in this process has specific types of research. So we need etiologic research to understand what caused the problem. We need diagnostic research to determine how to quickly determine who is affected and who is not affected. And we need prognostic and therapeutic research to decide what treatment or therapy or policies to use. And we can study people to collect information of different types in order to create this knowledge. And this is primary research when data are obtained from people and when data are put together from published papers into documents that synthesize primary research, this is called systematic review. And the fundamental starting point for any research, whether primary research or systematic review, is the framing of the problem or the research question. We'll come back to touch on what is the research question in a second. But first I want you to realize that one of the duties of healthcare professionals is to resolve uncertainty about the effects of treatment. We don't just resolve uncertainty about the effects of treatment by talking to our colleagues. We in fact help resolve uncertainties about effects of treatments by inviting our patients to take part in important research studies. And inviting people to take part in research studies is nowadays not something out of the extraordinary. It is in fact the norm. People take an interest in what is going on in research. The important thing is that when we think about research and people who will take part in research, we respect them. We think about the benefit and harm balance and we think about whether it is justifiable to undertake research. We, we're going to cover that under ethics, regulation, and consent when we go forward in my presentation. But look, the key thing is people are the important thing in science. The scientist is less important than the people who take part in science. And these people are invited by various means for coronavirus-related research. Here I show you some public adverts 
for people to come forward so they can take part in research in Pakistan, where I took part as a member of the research task force concerning coronavirus. <clears throat> and what is research? So a simple research design is this. We invite people to take part. We allocate them to different groups. We then follow up them. We follow them up to see their outcomes. From this follow up and outcomes, we have data collected. And from this, we can make these two by two tables. For example, do people in the intervention group have the desirable outcome more often than people who were not in the intervention group. And when we compare these, we can create what we call effect size. Any questions about this simple study design? It's important to understand this basic research design, because if we don't understand this, the rest of my presentation may not be so useful. If you have any comments or questions, please come forward at this stage. Do I take it that most of you are comfortable with this simple study design analysis that I have presented to you? Can at least one of you make a, com a, a comment about what I've said? Well, I think in my personal opinion, I think I understand the side that you are presenting us. Okay, right. So let's just move on. Thank you. Look, the effect size we have obtained from our research is going to be truthful for the sample of patients we have studied if we have honesty in the research we have conducted. If this effect size or the result that we have obtained is correct for the sample, then we have the possibility that this result may be beneficial to people outside our study. Because the sample that we obtained or who agreed to take part came from an eligible population. If the sample is representative of the eligible population, then I think we can be confident that our observed result can apply to the eligible population. We can also be confident that it can probably apply to the wider world outside the eligible population. How does that sound? Can you see now that if we do not do the research with integrity and honesty, in fact, the result we have obtained, the effect size from the data we collected, may not be applicable even to our own sample. If it is not true for our sample, it has in fact no hope of being true or applicable for the eligible population. And if it's not eligible for the population, it has no chance of being helpful to society. Why is this important? Well, in the life after Second World War, economic state of the world was getting better. Education state of the world was getting better. 
social development of the world was getting better. The, the survival of the world was in general getting better. But breast cancer mortality was continuing to rise. During this time, people were coming forward to take part in research. And by this time, in the late to mid 80s, nearly 30,000 women had taken part in breast cancer trials. It's only after these 30,000 women had volunteered into studies of good quality that were reasonably well conducted with appropriate approvals and monitoring and regulation that we were able to reduce breast cancer mortality. It, if this research had not been conducted, there is a possibility that this change in mortality may not have occurred. So you can see why conducting research and why conducting this research with integrity is important. Now this is probably conveys a message that research is important in the future. But does research help in the present? Do you think research will help patients who are taking part in research today? No. Well, thank you for coming forward. Could you give an explanation to your answer that yes. research may yes. not help patients in the present? Yes, I can give you my, my point of view. I, I personally believe that uh, research is uh, typically a methodology which helps to, to get results for future use. So to get uh, insights, uh, indications, and uh, information that could be used to, useful to develop new methodologies uh, or uh, new, new drugs or uh, maybe sometimes could be also helpful in, in the same time, but I believe that it's an exponential uh, um, opportunity then. Uh, yes, I, I, I apologize, I cannot see your name on my screen. Do you mind just mentioning who you are and uh... What I'm you do Daniele. so we can know your background as well. Yes, I'm Daniele Dele Casa. I'm from Italy and I have a, a NIT background. Uh, uh, so, sorry, could you just explain what is NIT? Uh, information technology. Right, okay. So your opinion is that research helps in the future patients? This is my point of view. Yeah. Maybe. Okay. Okay, very good. So, and I believe that your point of view is confirmed by the slide I just showed you a moment, which is right in front of us on the screen. Yes, I was, uh, I was about to say that I don't side with Daniel in this case, because actually it's depending on which kind of research you are doing. If you are considering all the information that you already have, and you are trying to study in order to give it a new interpretation, uh, this information that maybe no one realized about some little details can help to the people in the present. So is, the, I don't the, remember which are the names, the official names of the studies right now, but I have them in my mind, but I don't know which are the names. You believe that patients who take part in research may also benefit? Well, if the patients are going to take part in the research, like, uh, and it's going to be completely a new research and the research is going to take a lot of time. Mm, maybe just the patient or the people that are sick and they are trying to find a solution to this illness and this illness is being treated well by the doctors or by the scientists, maybe yes. But if not, I don't... I'm not completely sure if in all the cases, no. the patients are going to... Let's happen. make it a concrete example. Do you think during the last year pandemic, yes. the people who volunteered in trials of vaccination or who volunteered in studies of different medications, if they are admitted in the hospital, do you think they benefited or they did not benefit? If they were already in the hospital, did you say? So, sorry, please say that again. 
Uh, can you repeat the last part? If they were right. already in the hospitals or? So let's say people who were affected by coronavirus and admitted in the hospital. Yes. And then they were invited to take part in a trial, for example, of a medication that could uh, eradicate the virus, make the PCR test negative. Yes. Do you think such people benefited from taking part in studies? In my opinion, some people yes, some people no. The people that uh, was following and was taking the correct medicaments and was in somehow, yes, taking the correct drugs, they- well, look, we, look, coronavirus only arrived last year. We did not know what were the correct drugs. Yeah, but I mean, if uh, the so people the that died- in the hospital, doctor did not know what drug to give them. Yes, of course, but for example, the people who died, then these people, of course, didn't get any benefit, but the people who will get better or the people that now present a lot of immunity about the uh, respecting of the uh, coronavirus, then they will benefit. It's dependent on the case, in my opinion. But my question is, do you think the people who took part in research, did they benefit? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> you don't know. Okay. No, no problem. No, it's not an easy question to answer. I'm not looking for, a, I am looking for your opinion. I would appreciate if other people would also make some comments. I always will say it's dependent, but I don't know. Now, you, if you ask me for the, just one question, yes or no, I am not sure. I cannot, <laughs> I cannot answer you this. Okay, so Angel says in the chat that he says that there is, in current COVID research, there is great future, greater future projection. Uncle, do you mean that research benefits are for the future? And yes, okay. But Uncle, would you also believe that the people who take part in research also benefit? Okay. So you mean that people who were volunteering to be introduced, included in the study were somehow better than those who did not take part in the study? Anka? Well, it benefits the problem at hand for the future. I think that is correct. My question is, if Today, my PCR test comes positive and tomorrow I am taken to the hospital because I'm becoming ill and my oxygenation goes down. And the doctor said, well, we don't know whether we should give you medication X, but we can give you a chance to get the medication by entering a trial. Do you think I should say yes? You are smiling, uh, Daniele. What do you think? <laughs> we are smiling because you are making us very confused. <laughs> well, look, there is nothing to be confused about. The question is, if tomorrow you were in my place and the doctor was asking you, you are well enough, you are, your oxygen level is falling down. It's not so low down that you cannot make a decision. You can still think and talk. And they offer you the opportunity of taking drug X. Okay, then I go for it. If well, I'm going to die, I don't have anything. confirm that you will go, you will get the drug. They only confirm that you will get into a trial, randomized. You might get a placebo or you might get the drug. So if I get the placebo, the placebo is not doing anything good for me. But the drug is doing something good for me then. I will get the day it. when the doctor talks to you, you do not know. Yeah, this yeah. Drug, the pandemic did not exist before. This drug was not known before. It has not been used before. Well, maybe it has been trusted in animals, but not in humans. I think I think that uh, risk analysis should be done first. Well, the risk. I who mean, should do this risk analysis? I mean, if, if this. 
the ethics committee has done the risk analysis and given the approval for this drug to be offered in the context of a trial to the patients. Yeah, but regarding the, pa the patient itself, that was the subject you, you are asking for. I am asking about the subject, yes. It, it depends of uh, if, this, if this, this person who is committed to, to participate in the, in the trial is going to, uh, of course, you can compare a placebo and a drug, an experimental drug, but uh, it should be review what other treatments, additional treatments could be provided to this person. Fine. All the other additional treatments will be available to this person. They will not be stopped. Now address my question one more time. Then I think it's a personal question and it depends of the, uh, of the, okay. of the state of each person. Absolutely, this is a personal question. This is a personal question. I, as a patient, me, I would ask the doctor, is there a possibility that I could benefit? What will be the doctor's answer? Maybe. Okay. Well, look, uh, was it Enrique who you said that all the standard treatment that is available, what are the alternatives? Is that available? Is that Enrique? Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. Enrique, let me ask you something. When you refer to standard treatment, imagine we are talking about coronavirus, COVID. There is no standard treatment. Any treatment that you go in the hospital in March last year, and the doctor says, I'm going to give you this treatment, it's not standard. It's a complete experiment. Well, it's not a complete experiment, but nobody has researched it before. In fact, I am quite happy to call it a complete experiment because nobody has tested it before. In this case, in that specific case, mm -hmm. if I was a patient before uh, joining the, the experiment, I would uh, think about my uh, physical condition, my uh, um, medical story regarding uh, respiratory uh, status and so on. And probably I would make a, a personal decision based on this. On the, because last March, okay. of course, there, there, there was not too much info about, about coronavirus, mm -hmm. but uh, there was some type of people who uh, was believed that were primarily affected. Okay, but uh, Enrique, if it was known that taking part in research was beneficial in general, maybe that will encourage you. Yeah, but in that case, uh, probably I would refuse being part in an experimental trial if I think that uh, because of my physical condition, uh, I have a significant uh, percentage of recovery completely from the illness without suffering too much. Okay, okay, good point, good point. Uh, Angel makes a point in the chat that uh, the research is influenced by market rules gives rise about doubts and contraindications. For example, the challenge between Pfizer and AstraZeneca. Uh, and he gives an example that in Spain today, 600 people saying that mixing them up could be good. Well, look, Enrique, uh, sorry, Angel, what a beautiful opportunity to conduct a fantastic research experiment. You can offer people the opportunity to be continue with AstraZeneca, 
or take the second of Pfizer and follow them up with their outcomes? What do you think? Ah, you mean political interests are bending the research? Well, um, Ankel, you make an interesting point. Look, I know almost nothing about politics, so I cannot make any comment. All I would say is that if there is uncertainty, I'm not talking about political uncertainty, about certainty in the minds of people who will receive or reject treatment, then I think there is a possibility that a new research question has arisen and needs addressing. So look, I'm gonna make a little break here with this discussion because it can go on all night and all week. Uh, I'll go forward with, uh, and, and thanks Angel for making your comments and uh, Enrique and Daniel and Daniele and, and the lady colleague who make comments, I didn't get your name. Please, could you say your name? Patricia. Patricia, thank you. So please feel free to come back with comments as I go forward in my presentation. I'm gonna give you some information about research conducted about whether it is beneficial to take part in research. In fact, a lot of research has been conducted to address this question. And here are some of those papers. I present only four of these by others and one by my own group in London in the past. And this one of the studies uh, by other groups shows that the majority of the studies which compare being part of a study or not being part of a study with the same condition, then being part of the study leads to better outcomes. And in fact, this result is true even when the trial result is negative. Now, if you think about it, if a trial is being conducted after approval by ethics committee, and it has a data monitoring committee and a, data, and a safety monitoring committee and a steering committee, and the nurse is required to follow the protocol closely and the monitoring of the protocol is audited and the regulator can come and inspect all the data at any time during the course of the study. Just imagine this patient is getting more care than the patient who is not in the study. If I am tomorrow asked the question whether I should be part of a randomized trial or receive the standard care in which there is no ethical approval, there is no safety monitoring, there is no data monitoring, there is no inspection suddenly by a regulator, there is no oversight of the nurse, I would prefer to be in a research where all of these things occur. We repeat this study only for women's health. And guess what? There are some studies that are positive, some are not positive, but on average, when we combine the results, there is a 20% benefit of being part of a study. Important thing is this study must be done with integrity and honesty. Then there is a good chance that on average, there'll be benefit of being part in a study. The knowledge generated through this study will ultimately need to reach the patients or the public for it to be beneficial to society. This requires that this knowledge should be able to persuade other people. And this persuasion cannot happen. The confidence in the knowledge cannot happen if there are problems with integrity and honesty of the study. And if people are not persuaded then decision-making and implementation and continuation cannot occur. 
the pipeline from research to use is leaky. This leak can only be stopped if there is honesty and integrity in the studies. So I summarize that ethical research, ethical healthcare provision is necessary for reduction of uncertainty. The research benefits future patients, but also benefits the patients who take part in the research. If the research is conducted with honesty and integrity. The opportunities to take part in research should be part of a system that delivers healthcare. And without integrity, science cannot benefit neither the patients in the present nor the patients in the future. Any questions before I move on? Sorry, can I make a question? Please, please do, please do. Do, do you think that this 20% uh, um, of people which uh, is uh, improved is uh, well-being uh, also because of part of the study uh, could be found also in the, in the case of the COVID, which is completely unknown? Okay, look, I, I do not know the specific answer for COVID, but just imagine you are being treated in a system where there is no prior knowledge. The doctor has the same knowledge that the patient has. The nurse has the same knowledge that the patient has. In this situation, what would be better? I would want to be in a system that monitors safety as part of a research trial that collects more data from me than the usual clinical care, that has more staff available to look after me, because in addition to the usual clinical nurse, there is also a research nurse. In fact, I am in a great luxurious position if I am part of a study, because suddenly somebody is paying attention to me because they want my data. If I'm not in the system, I might as well just stay at home and not go to the hospital. It makes sense. Okay. Think of it in a different way. Do you think you can be an astronaut and say to the space program, I want to go to space, but I'm not going to give you my data. No, this is not possible. Come on then. People, when they come to hospital, they should also be given the opportunity to take part in research. Yes, but I think there are two really different cases. Oh, because... Come on, man. A patient in March entering the hospital with COVID-19 is the same person as the one going to space in the shuttle. Yeah, but... Uh, For uh, the first time. If I want to go to the space, probably uh, I have been, uh, I have performed a lot of tests and a lot of physical tests and uh, different tests in different conditions. So it's not like being uh, uh, put in a completely new system. The it's, first person who went into space was put in the completely new system. Not the first one, not, but and uh, probably the first one. <laughs> The first one and was the first patient entering the hospital with coronavirus is oh, entering a completely new system. The knowledge of this patient is the same as the knowledge of the doctor and the nurse. Yeah, but one is voluntary, the other not. Yeah, okay, I understand that. I simply <laughs> give this extreme example to highlight that there is benefit gained by being part of a study. I'm not sure that the first dog that we uh, visit, we had visit the, the space 
is a, is a, uh, agrees with your point. I'm not talking about a dog. I'm talking about a human being. <laughs> you cannot be a human being who wants to fly to space and not share your data. No, no, sure. Yeah. I agree with you. Okay, let's move on to the next step, which is planning the research. Hey, Professor, can I just say Yes, please. Patricia, you say we want to say something. Yes, do you think that is a bit like... Um, I, I forget the, the word you explained. It's chantage. How do you say chantage in English? Uh, when you say to one person, ah, if you want this, you have to give me this. Blackout. Yes, thank you, Blackout. Okay, Blackout will like blackmail, I think. Okay, so uh, do you think uh, it is not a big blackmail, a big blackmail to say to someone, okay, if you want to enter to this research or to whatever, you have to give me your data. Maybe in the case of coronavirus, no, but don't you think that in the future maybe that's be possible, for example, for getting an uh, insurance and health insurance? If you want me to uh, insurance your life, it you will have to be your, your data. You're, you're right. It will be blackmail if you are forced to do it. But it will not be blackmail if the study is well designed. It will be conducted with integrity. It has ethics approval. It has data safety monitoring. And in fact, in this situation, think about it it will be blackmail to not offer participation in the research. Because all those people who are not in the research do not receive an ethically approved care. They do not receive data safety monitoring. They do not receive additional nurse care. Which is blackmail? You tell me. No, no, of course, of course, I understand your point. So I, I, I like you use the word blackmail. It is a strong word, but think about it. Providing care outside research in a setting like coronavirus could be equated to blackmail because the knowledge that doctor has is the same as that of the patient. He does not have any more knowledge. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. No, you can make your own analysis. I prefer to use extreme examples because I think they try to make the point. And clearly the truth is between something that comes from my extreme example and something that is at the other end. And each one of you has to create your own belief system by examining what I say, by examining your own experience, by examining what you read. Uh, but look, I can tell you, well, I don't have to tell you, you know yourself. If you make decisions by examining what you read in your textbooks, then clearly you are only reading the history of that subject because the book is already out of date by several years before it is published and comes in your hands. You are not reading what is required now. Well, fortunately there are things that Few. <laughs> the textbooks are only good for passing exams. Real life is not passing exam. Real life is dealing with the coronavirus when it arrives in February in 2020. That is real life. And that is what requires research. That is what requires for all of us. All of you, me, as well as all of society to be aware that without the correct scientific experiments, I use the word experiment carefully. I don't like to use the word experiment routinely because I think a lot of stuff that we do outside research is also an experiment. We just don't call it an experiment. Okay, let's move to planning. Research. I'm, I'm glad you are still smiling, Patricia. <laughs> I have uh, my Daniel, big YouTube, that I have and some smiling. of the others, I can't see all your faces. I hope you are also all smiling. 
I don't want you to become depressed after listening to my lecture. Thank you for, uh, for the thumbs up. Let's, let's go to ethics committee. Well, look, some years ago, I published a paper which described this process where from the clinical problem, we want to change lives. This is a journey and I and other colleagues recommend that in this journey, even from the first day, patients and the public should be involved in deciding what should be done. Well, I, I take this idea and extend it forward. And here are the different stages that we will go through in research and its implementation. I would like to talk with respect to integrity about planning, conduct and publication. So please keep, keep this roadmap in mind. So we first talk about ethics and consent. Before you go to ethics, you've got to create the protocol. Before you create the protocol, you've got to ask the right question. You submit this protocol to ethics committee. Hopefully it won't be just the ethics committee of the little clinic where you work because hopefully you will plan to do the research with multiple colleagues and it will be a multi-center study. And then once ethics approval is given, then you will need local approval in order to be able to approach the first patient with the consent form. Even before you approach the first patient with the consent form, you would have gone through the process of creating a protocol, having it reviewed by ethics committee and by the local committee in your own hospital. And you will give a patient information sheet to the patient. Can you see that integrity already comes into play even before the first patient is approached? The study design if with respect to study design, this is like a published infographic. Uh, I, I'll cover some aspects of it. It relates primarily to publication. But I urge you to think about how fake news is produced by scientists. Well, they can do that by using too small a sample size by not blind testing, by not using control group, by using unrepresentative samples. And to avoid this problem, the greater and the good have created levels of evidence. And they say that experimental or randomized studies are the best then controlled studies and then uncontrolled studies. And this is called, well, the hierarchy of evidence. So you would hope that ethics committee would not give approval for study that, for a study that is not at a high enough level of hierarchy of evidence. This is where integrity begins. Address the research question with the correct design. The second element of integrity is the justification for undertaking research. So the first thing you need to do is understand the background importance of the topic. To understand this, you need to examine the prevalence of the disease, the, qual the effect on quality of life of people, the economic effect and the priority of patients. It's not a matter of scientific indulgence. It's not a decision a supervisor will make over coffee with the student as to what topic we will study. This topic importance need to be evaluated according to these and more criteria. Once you have an important topic, the next thing to study is, why do you need to do the study today? To address this problem, you need to figure out whether previous papers exist on the same topic what is the quality of these papers? If there are no papers, you can commence a new study. If the previous papers are not of a good level of evidence, then you can commence a new study of a good level of evidence. 
And if previous papers of good level of evidence exist, then you can think about whether there is a justification for repeating a study of good level of evidence. If you can meet all these criteria, you have the first starting point of a study with integrity that you can present to ethics committee. I take a small break here for any comment or question. Sorry, I have a question about this. Please go ahead. Yeah, um, in the case of coronavirus, it's a, it was a, a new topic, of course, but uh, uh, I could have the, the chance to, to read a lot of uh, different papers based on this, so basically on the same on the same uh, um, topics. Okay, in this case, this uh, methodology is not applicable. So, what do you propose? The people should just keep on repeating the studies? No, they they already did this. But look, some repetition is necessary. It is possible that. Um, <clears throat> a study that works in a setting, let's say in a country like Pakistan of my origin, may not work in a setting like Switzerland. And in this case, people in Switzerland might say, well, we would like to repeat the study just to check that in our system of healthcare and living and culture, this new intervention could work. But we also try to deal with this problem ahead of time. For example, a vaccine trial may be conducted at the same time in the UK, in Africa, in South America, as well as in Asia, so that when this big study is finished, in fact, the repetition is inbuilt inside the study. But look, nobody is today going to say that Einstein theory of relativity needs to be repeated. Or will they say that? Well, there comes a time when correct factual information gets embedded in the belief system and practice so strongly that no repetition is required. The age of the last paper is not important. But for some other situations, and COVID is a good example, where steady repetition may be necessary or may be inbuilt into planning of an important project. For example, in the case of creating studies that assess the effectiveness of vaccinations. So the model I propose here is a simplistic way to look at it, determine the importance of the problem according to the way it affects society. And then determine if previous research exists on my question, then determine if the existing research is of good or bad quality. And if it is of not such a good quality, then do study of good quality. And then if good quality studies exist, then determine whether it needs repetition in my setting. So I, I think this is a simple way. And in fact, in my opinion, a very logical way, because if you are repeating studies of good quality that don't need repetition, this is, in my opinion, not honest behavior. because the correct honest behavior in this situation would be to use the knowledge previously generated for doing whatever needs to be done. Make sense? Okay, let's move on. Ethics committee will consider these three features that I mentioned to you before. Uh, I learned a lot about ethics by reading this book about which I was asked to give a review. In the end, the bottom line is we need to respect people. If somebody makes a personal decision as Enrique earlier pointed out, 
I will make a personal choice. If he makes a personal choice that he does not want to be part of a study, he cannot be forced to be part of a study. So you remember I, in my first slide, I gave you an example of, <clears throat> of uh, an unethical study conducted by the United States uh, Public Health. They basically did not tell black people that they were suffering from syphilis or injected them with syphilis and they did not give them treatment just to study the prognosis. This is not treating people with respect. But this will not be permitted, hopefully, in the current day. And the important feature here is that if there is a person with diminished power to make decisions, for example, a child, then their parents or some other method should be available to make a decision on their behalf. The next is to determine the, the risk and benefit. So if alternative treatments are already beneficial, as Enrique pointed out, he would like to know what is the alternative treatment. Then in fact, the control group should not be placebo. It should perhaps be the alternative treatment. Does that make sense? So this becomes an important part of designing the study. The benefit, the benefit of risk and harm and then there should be justice. So I now give you some examples and ask you some questions. Give you some examples of real life. <clears throat> you are an investigator. You are going to do a cluster trial. Cluster trial is where individual patients are not randomized, but clinics are randomized. OK, so you say some clinics will receive this new treatment and the other clinics will continue to give the standard treatment. Usually the new treatment is added to the standard treatment. It's not a replacement in this type of situation. And my question is, in this situation, do you need to obtain consent from individual patients to be part of the study? Yes, I guess, yes. Most people would say yes. Yes, because imagine if you have a side effect because the combination of the drugs or something like that. What are you doing? <laughs> but, uh, uh, I also don't know the right answer. I gave you the previous principles that we need to respect the autonomy of the individuals. We need to have the benefit and uh, risk harm benefit and harm balance, sorry. Uh, and we need to consider judiciously whether there is a need for this study. Okay, I give you an example of a published paper. In this paper, one intervention to support the nursing staff to give interventions for improving breastfeeding. And in the other one, they receive the standard care. This is a trial where I am also a part of the investigators. We requested the ethics committee that they should allow us to avoid the need to obtain consent from individuals. Do you think they permitted us to do it or not? Uh, can you repeat what uh, they are going to allow uh, Can you just ask that question one more time? I, I, your, your English is fantastic. I don't understand your question because your line breaks up every so often. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank, you. thank you for, the, for my English. Well, uh, I mean, uh, what you were asking if uh, they were allowing what? What was your question about this slide? My question was, uh, was uh, here is a trial. Some clinics will receive a specific training for the nurses or midwives 
who give help to women for breastfeeding. Yes. And other clinics will not receive this training. They will just give the usual care to the mothers that they normally give. In this case, is it important to obtain the consent from the mother? Well, look, this training could be a medication. Yes, I think training yes. is an intervention. Yes. Education, the I most the, yes. the most commonly used intervention every day for billions of people in the world without testing or experimentation or research is what? Education. Yes, but in any case, you are taking... Uh, I mean, education can be very harmful yeah. if it's not delivered correctly. Yeah. Almost as harmful as a medication, right? Yes. So please don't consider that just because it is education, ethics don't apply. <laughs> okay, okay. If I can answer your question or give my opinion in the, on this topic, because you're, you're asking if, if it's good to... Or if it's fair, no? Um, if some patients from one clinic receive one education um, course to do something and on the other, no, right? Mm -hmm. so, no, no, I'm not asking this. I'm asking in a study that is designed to do what you just said, for the patients who take part in the study, do they need to give informed consent? Oof. <laughs> that is my question. In fact, if let me see if I can put my question. Yeah, is individual consent required? Look, the answer is not straightforward. I can tell you that in this project, the ethics committee agreed with us, the investigators, that we do not need informed consent. It's it's hard to say if, if you should well, it's, uh, it's not give easy. information. It's not easy. That is why we have ethics committees. The ethics committee have people with many different expertise who will consider what the investigator wish to do and then they will give approval. And the ethics committee would also have patients, representatives. I will say that it will be like uh, uh, like with a, pharmaco a pharmacological product. The same, they, it, they should follow the same ethics and they should do the same protocol. The ethics is exactly this. The ethics principles are exactly the same. Exactly. not change whether it's a pharmaceutical product or not. The ethical yes. principle is exactly the same. It does not change. Exactly, exactly. Because mm -hmm. you are you're affecting to someone's decision and future actions <laughs> because of well, what you're going to great, teach. Look, this is a great responsibility. I Is it Regina who's talking? Regina Garcia? Or is it somebody else? No, Me, yeah, I'm Laura. Laura. I came late, sorry. I am, have uh, work late and I ah. am... I joined the call later, sorry. Yeah, no problem, no problem. Look, you, you, you said a great word. It's a great responsibility. And this great responsibility is not just the responsibility of the ethics committee. It is the responsibility of the investigator. Yeah, I agree. Okay, uh, Angel made a good point. The results are not life-threatening, so it is okay to not give informed consent. I just like to make a small comment, Angel. I think the point here is not about life threatening. The point here that we made to the ethics committee is that the data for measurement of the results or the outcomes is routinely collected. So even if the study did not exist, all these women are going to be asked whether they are breastfeeding or not. And because the results were routinely collected, I believe that was the main reasons why they gave us approval to avoid the need for informed consent. In my personal point of view, uh, the data is treated to, to perform the, the study should be agreed by the, the patient. Because... Yes. Yeah. So for, just imagine if you go to the hospital, there is some data from you routinely collected. Yeah. But Perhaps the... people don't even ask you. 
or perhaps they ask you and you sign something but you did not really read the consent form that's possible such routinely collected data can serve as an outcome measure in a trial no in my opinion no if it's not uh, uh, specifically written in the in the paper that i sig i signed well i i think very many people can take this point of view that you are describing daniele and in fact it is possible that if this idea was presented to another ethics committee possibly in another city or in another country they may have reached a different decision but i'm explaining to you that these decisions are not easy and in this case in this published paper it was permitted by the ethics committee that informed consent is not required i also want to highlight that there is no one right decision in many situations and i hope you recall what i said a little while ago i am using extreme examples to make some educational points and i'm not using these extreme examples to say this is how life should change in the future so please don't think that i'm saying that all studies can be done without informed consent i am in fact saying the exact opposite thank you and, and thank you for making these comments it makes my time spent with you enjoyable and useful i ask you one more question you are a surgeon who's planning a study of an operation you know that outcomes can be measured by blinding to the intervention or without blinding you are asking the ethics committee that you want to perform an operation that requires three incisions or two incisions and you want to compare it to the standard operation which has only one incision and you want the ethics committee to give you permission to perform one or two extra incisions in the control group do you think they will give you the permission oh yeah i think you have to use the favorite word eh? where you want to make more damage to some patients well i don't want to make anything i want to find out if the new intervention is better than standard care in the standard operation there is only one incision in the new operation there is two or three incisions so this is the reason if you can justify that making those incision those two or three incision are going to be better for the patient because maybe you are not going to open all his chest and you are just going to make little incisions maybe they are going to allow you but if you are going to do this the incision are going to be the same few big and the, are the other so incisions are small in this case I can do it again. I think that follow that falls into the patient uh, consent. So you can ask, and they can say, okay, if the patient, I, I'm, you give the the resource and all. So it's not just an a random idea. You you should study a little bit why you want to try to do this change and why do you think it's better, right? So, so maybe. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Look, you got to you got to think all of this, and then present your idea to the to the ethics committee. In this case, again, another study of mine, which is already published, uh, and I always, when I say mine, I am referring to a group of people who work together. I have almost never done a study single-handedly in my whole life. Uh, so our group presented to the committee the idea that. we should be permitted to have the same number of incisions in all the patients who take part in the study and this additional incision in the control group will be called a sham incision uh in this case we were able to convince the committee that they should allow us to do this Uh, Daniela, you are scratching your head. 
I don't have a clear op opinion about that. Yeah. Okay. Let me just uh, let me just remind you what I said a little while ago. Before this study, thousands of people are receiving this operation without knowing whether it is effective. They are all having free incisions all the time. It is not known whether this operation works or does not work or is harmful. When this research is completed, it will be done in 20 centers. It will have several hundred patients taking part. When this research is completed, it will be known whether it works or does not work. At the end of this trial, it will be possible to tell the patient that it works or does not work. Before this, people are taking this, people are being given this operation. They are taking this operation, accepting it on faith, basically. And in my opinion, the operation provided without this research evidence is the real experiment. And there is no informed consent for this in the sense that it is an ethically approved procedure. That case, always compare the situation in research to what is standard practice. Because the alternative is not to be part of the study, but to be part of usual practice. And usual practice is not free of risk. The usual practice is not free of harm. So you need to present, you need to prepare your idea. You need to determine its importance. You need to determine that it is needed. And then when you say it is all needed, then you present your justification to the ethics committee. And then things can move forward. Ethics committee may or may not agree with you. And there are many other requests I've made to ethics committee that they have rejected. I presented to you two examples because they are thought provoking. I also now go back to a comment made by Angel, and I think it referred to the previous example where I said that routinely collected data was used for uh, outcome measurement. He's expressing concern that our data are collected all the time and many times without our consent. And I agree with Angel that uh, if data are connected, collected without consent, they should not be used. I, I agree with you, Ankel, on that. Thank you. Thank you for making that point. I, I'm going to make this, with this slide one point very quickly that research ethics don't just apply to human research, also to animal research. In this slide, I show you a meta-analysis of a topic in human studies where it is known that the treatment is effective. And it is known in 1990 that this treatment is effective. It is also known, sorry, it's known in 1988 uh, that this treatment is effective. And in 1994 that this treatment is effective. In this situation, when it is known in humans that this treatment works, will it be justifiable in 1998 or 2000 to do this experiment in animals? <clears throat> Angel says it will not be justifiable. Thank you for your comment, Angel. Thinking in a simple way, if we are already using the treatment in human beings and the animal research was planned to discover whether this treatment should be used in humans, the question is already settled. There is no need to keep studying the same question in animals. The principles of ethics with respect to repetition also apply in animal research. The key principles they say in ethical animal research are replace animal, reduce and refine. I guess they should also write, don't repeat if the answer is already known for use in society. 
Make sense? Okay. The journals are where all researchers aim to direct their research when their research is completed. International Committee of Medical Journal Editors states that your research should be prospectively registered. Talking about clinical trials, it states that. And I recommend to you that after writing your protocol and having it approved by ethics committee and before recruiting your first patient, please register your study and please prepare your protocol for submission to a journal for publication. These to me are the most ethical ways to undertake studies with integrity. Are you, are you saying to, do, to perform this procedure before the, do, to, to start the study? That's correct. Oh, okay. Register your study before the first patient is recruited. And if you have already written the protocol because you submitted it to the ethics committee, why not prepare your protocol for submission to a journal for publication? But it, it's not clear uh, one thing for, for me. Uh, the, the protocol um, will be published then or not? The or protocol will be published sometime during the course of your study. Okay. But it will have been submitted to a journal before your first patients are recruited. Okay. Yeah. But registration is essential before the first patient is recruited. Okay, so th this, so if you think about it now, we have taken the journey from clinical problem to research question, to designing the study, to submitting it to ethics committee. And we are now proceeding to recruit the first patient. I request you to consider registration and protocol publication as an integral part of the research journey. The trial registration requires a simple set of small key pieces of information. And here is a checklist for writing up the protocol for submission to a journal. So guidance on how this should be done is readily available for any of you who will embark on this journey. Well, we now move to conducting the research. You are the investigator. You are also lucky to have <clears throat> obtained a European grant to conduct your study. With this grant, you have employed a research nurse. How will you ensure that she has the necessary knowledge and skills to obtain valid consent? I have to train her, maybe. So you will train her? Yes. At the beginning, probably I will conduct conduct a, a, an interview with with the, all the people which is involved in the in the study to to understand if they are they have the skills to to perform the, the study, and then I will uh, conduct also a training pe period to 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 help them to perform the, the study proper properly. Okay. So look, I, I just make a very quick point. There is something called GCP. Have you heard about this before? I have a different background, so. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But th that is why I ask if, if, uh, if you have heard about GCP before. No. Okay, Angel also says uh, he hasn't heard about it. So look, GCP is a course called Good Clinical Practice. 
It is a course available in most countries for free on a web portal. In fact, in most research-based institutions, for example, universities or university hospitals, they offer such courses for research staff. My advice would be that if your study includes recruiting patients from clinics and hospitals, that you request your staff and you yourself take such a course. It is normally able to be completed within a few hours in one or two days maximum. Uh, and once you have the certificate, it allows you to be sure that you have received proper qualification concerning compliance with protocol, concerning protection of patients' rights, and concerning regulatory research requirements. Do you have any data about the percentage of uh, uh, um, nurses which has this uh, specific uh, um, uh, achievement? So okay. So in, in my career, I have undertaken around 40 studies where patients have been included, primary studies. And the number of patients in these studies is nearly uh, 100,000. I can tell you that nobody in my studies has taken a consent or has, if they have taken a consent without doing a GCP course, it would have been because of an oversight on my part. But otherwise it is a requirement. And I have every two years updated my own GCP training uh, throughout my research career as a researcher who's recruiting patients directly or is leading studies who's recruiting patients. So this is a standard requirement for doctors and nurses taking consent from patients for taking part in studies, including also other health professionals like physiotherapists and uh, possibly also pharmacists. So the point I'm trying to make here is just because somebody has a professional qualification does not automatically ensure that they understand what is necessary with respect to research. <clears throat> okay. If you do a research project, you will be required to have a site file. <clears throat> Probably this site file will include all of these pieces of information. It is important for this site file to be maintained correctly because at any time your institution can conduct an audit or inspect uh, your research project. If your institution does not have these mechanisms in place, I'm afraid you need to think about whether you are conducting research in the correct institution. So we dealt with this example of what training is required and what type of documentation is required in order to properly conduct a research project in a setting where clinical care is provided to people. I ask you now a different question, change your role. You are now the director of the hospital where research takes place. The director of the clinical research department of that hospital. And you have received a complaint that some patients have been recruited to studies without consent. How will you investigate this problem? Well, it depends of the of the structure of the of the hospital. I mean, if there is any possibility of uh, investigate through a internal audit. Okay, so internal um, audit is one good 
a good uh, good good suggestion uh, yeah but uh, checking be, being careful with the with the in the level of independence of of these uh, audits because in some cases some people can't uh, hide some mistakes of other people to uh, support colleagues so it depends on the structure of the hospital i think so th th these are good points thank you for bringing them up it's not an easy problem now i think if you still remember in my first few slides when i introduced you i happened to serve as research director in two hospitals and i can tell you that for a director it is not a pleasant thing to do to investigate your own colleagues because there is a complaint made that they have recruited patients into studies without consent and for this type of situation there is normally in the uk what is called concern at work policy and this policy is too general because it deals with all types of concerns not just research related concern and here is one example of a formal documentation that gives guidance about how to investigate when misconduct in research is alleged in a particular situation if these mechanisms exist in an institution then i think i as a patient would be confident that i can take part in research in that institution because if people who are dealing with me are trained and if there is monitoring and checking and investigation should problems arise then look i am in a, a place where i am safe i present this as a joke because the alternatives need to be compared with the study at the time of planning and ethics approval will be the correct stage where it is evaluated whether this study can go forward for presentation to patients and then when it is presented these are some of the key things that need to be considered in informed consent you need to give information you need to make sure that the patient or the volunteer understands and that they actually give the consent voluntarily and to look at it in a simple way diagrammatically you give information which could be written verbal by a video backed by a web page and then you allow time for people to consider this information and then if they agree you proceed to include them in the study and this process continues at every stage throughout the study if at any stage the patient wants to withdraw from the study they are free to do so this is what is real informed consent this type of a informed consent procedure and its related documentation including the information sheet will all have been seen and approved by the ethics committee before the first patient receives this information the informed consent would need to be free of coercion and it need to be free of undue influence and here is the long list of things that need to go well here is a short version of the long list of things that need to go into the informed consent and once we have gone through the informed consent i now invite you to think about how the study 
should be monitored and how its monitoring should be organized. So typically there is a group of investigators. Within the group of investigators, there is a small group that monitors the study. By monitor, I mean manage the study internally. And this management group is usually made up of the chief investigator and the statistician and possibly the main people, representative of the main people who are recruiting patients. The chief investigator reports directly to the funder or to other bodies like the ethics committee or the sponsor or the research director. The chief investigator is also part of a monitoring committee. The monitoring committee should be made of an independent group of people. These people are not investigators. They will not be named as authors on the published paper. They give advice to the chief investigator. They are there for protecting the patients. <clears throat> You are going to need to have to do all of these things in the course of the study. Obtain the various approvals, set up the study, set up the meeting, set up the training, support the staff, recruit the patients, write your new letters, get the monitoring done. Loads of things to be done in the course of the study before you reach publication. And one of those things is data monitoring. This needs to be done confidentially. Typically, it is done by a group of people independent of the investigators who can inform the monitoring committee, who can then inform the chief investigator as to what actions should be taken. These actions could include stop the study immediately, could include continue the study with some modification, could include continue the study without any changes. Any questions about study monitoring? This type of monitoring oversight arrangement is an essential arrangement for honesty and integrity in a study. How does that sound? It sounds clear. Very clear. Okay, thank you. Now uh, you can see that a study is not an individual job. Many roles are required. So you need to collaborate with a lot of people. You need to stay in touch with the people who work with you. You need to communicate with them in writing, possibly on paper, but also electronically. You need to arrange meetings around your and look, all of these things that, are, uh, that I'm putting up here are relevant activities, including sending chocolates on Christmas to your collaborators. So they remain engaged and positive. They become part of your research family. We now need, we now need to move on to the last part. Let's now see that your research is completed. Now you need to bring it to the four through publication. What is involved with respect to integrity over here? Well, this is what we think about when it comes to the research publication cycle. Have any of you published papers? Ankel, you said you haven't published papers. Are you planning to publish one? I mean, I know how is the process because I was about to publish one when I was in university, but at the end, I didn't, we didn't publish it. Enrique published papers, but that to leave one or 10 minutes, but he, he published papers. Okay, so many times the main idea we think about is that the publication is rejected, revised, resubmitted, eventually it is accepted, right? 
I take you through the journey of the same trial I showed you where the sham incision was permitted by the ethics committee. So I can take you through the full journey of the life of this study. The idea was conceived in 1996. After various approvals, the first patients were recruited in 1998. The recruitment went slowly in the first few years. It became a multi-center study. Many patients were recruited. And by 2006, the recruitment was completed. Soon after the follow-up was completed. And in a few years, the study was published after a few rejections and revisions. The result of the study was that the new surgical operation that needed three incisions did not work. We also put this trial together along with other studies. There were four other studies into a meta-analysis and combining all those results also confirmed that it did not work. And this is the trial that, this is the meta-analysis of all the studies put together, confirming the finding that this intervention was not effective. Guess what, as this, as this individual meta-analysis was published, yet another trial was published in another country. Well, one can be excused for continuing to repeat the trial when only three or four previous exist. But basically in 2010, we reached a stage where there was no need for any more new trials in order to decide what to do. The UK National Institute uh, that gives guidance confirmed that this intervention was not effective and it should not be used. So this journey eventually led to the removal of this intervention from practice. And there is a different story that still people continue to use this intervention in, for example, countries where data are collected in Australia it has been shown that this operation is one of those useless treatments that continues to be used by doctors. Well, you could say inflicted on patients without any hope of it giving any benefit. Well, that's the, that's the journey of that trial, its publication and its outcome. What is a journal? The journal is a thing that is produced by a chief editor who has a team of editors who work according to certain rules. They receive papers, assess those papers, reject a lot of them, accept some of them, and some of those that are accepted are then sent to the publisher, who then puts them together on a website or on paper, and then it becomes a journal. So this is a very simple description of what's a journal. See here that the journal does not invest anything in research. There is an exception called health technology assessment and there are possibly some other exceptions where the journal also funds the research. But in most circumstances, the journal is not responsible for funding research. It is only responsible for publishing articles. So the journal's responsibility starts after the research is completed. Some journals use a format called open access. For the sake of simplicity, there are three types of journals, traditional and open access and predatory. So the traditional journals are the ones that had life as paper journals and now possibly the paper version is disappearing and only online. The open access version, the main difference is that the open access 
may charge the authors a publication fees, but it does not charge the readers any fees. And then there is this predatory version which charges the author as well as the reader. This version only exists to make money. It does not exist to promote scientific integrity. And there is a whole list of this type of journal published on the web. So be careful, don't submit your journal, your, your article to such a journal. If you have already funding, go to an open access journal, which will follow appropriate assessment procedures like traditional journals, will perhaps charge you a fees, but will not charge the fees to the reader. Keep in mind that the traditional journal is not free. It may be free to the author, but frequently the author's institution through its library pays the traditional journal. The journals follow guidelines produced by this committee and some others, including, for example, on publication ethics, as shown here. And they also use checklists like the ones reported by this website for how to report particular types of papers. But all of these checklists relate to how to write a paper. They don't necessarily relate to how to conduct research. For example, they ask you how to write your method section, but please, you need to have thought about all this before you recruited the first patient. This is how integrity is introduced into research and then maintained throughout the course of the study while data are collected and analyzed before the public, the work is presented for assessment for publication. The editors are constantly looking for these type of problems and they constantly find such problems, problems in data collection, in analysis, et cetera, et cetera, including falsification of data. And after publication, anybody can make a complaint about falsification and in fact, an author may have to then justify why their study is not false. Because now a whole industry of complainers has developed because they don't trust the institutions and researchers. So they go to complaining to journals where the work done is published. And this is called post peer review, post publication peer review. So here, allegations of data fabrication can be made. Here, for example, in a paper, over 5,000 randomized trials have been assessed by Mr. Carlyle to see if some of them are fabricated so that he can then make allegations to these journals for possible fabrication of data. And because scientists like all human beings are jealous and untrusting of other human beings and other scientists. This has created a problem between scientists of false complaints. So the complainer says, I am making the complaint because science need to be transparent. But in fact, there is guidelines on what are the red flags to identify a false complainer. And there are also guidelines to check integrity of a paper, but these of a published paper, but these checklists all include assessment of published work. Really what is required is integrity in research at the time when it is planned, when it is approved, when it is conducted, when it is analyzed. The last two papers, for, uh, uh, by the way, that I showed you is from one of the top journals, the Nature Journal, which has picked up this problem of both fabrication, integrity, and false complaints. And 
it now brings me back to all the circle back to some of the first few things I said to you. Medical misinformation or research generated to inform evidence-based medicine, the integrity of the research published, all of this is a complete mess. I bring my presentation to an end with some comments. A, a slide given to me by a Dutch colleague who has undertaken lots of work in integrity and highlights that integrity and honesty in research is not just about published papers. It's about methodological issues at the time of deciding the question, designing the study, obtaining approval, conducting the study, collecting the data. The integrity of the data is only one small aspect, a very important aspect, but one of several aspects of integrity. And then there is the issue of reporting and uh, usefulness. And then there are other issues that follow after that with respect to whether transparent, valid, truthful, and useful research is ultimately put into practice to improve outcomes. So I take you back to the steps of evidence-based medicine, asking question, acquiring the evidence, evaluating the evidence for truthfulness, and then applying truthful, useful evidence in practice. Remember, I also said, in my view, in the view of many, science is for society. By society, I mean people. By people, I mean not just you and me as scientists, but also you and me as members of society. One way of introducing honesty in research is by involving these people in all the stages of research. This is called patient and public involvement. And I give you some examples of how they can be involved. And I believe that by involving them, integrity and honesty can be improved uh, within research. So if people are involved at the time of planning the research, Perhaps we can use the more correct priorities. Perhaps we can use the more patient-oriented outcomes and results, not just things that matter to us as scientists, but things that matter to people when they are affected uh, with respect to health issues. Perhaps during the monitoring of the study in the conduct of the research, the representative of patient and public can make an important contribution. Perhaps you will be surprised, but I will not be because I know that in the coming years, patients or patient representatives will also be peer reviewers of the papers submitted, manuscripts submitted for publication. In fact, many journals have make it, made it obligatory to include in the method section how patients were engaged in the research. And finally, of course, patients are very important in dissemination of the findings of valid and useful studies. So I invite you to think about using the power your patient participants, research participants can bring to your own research by engaging them right from the beginning. And I conclude by saying that science is for society, research, well, goes without saying is essential. Research should be conducted to produce 
the highest level of evidence so that evidence-based medicine becomes possible. Ethical governance and oversight is essential to the highest level of evidence. And informed consent is essential to engagement of patients in and for their participation in research. And with this, I bring my presentation to an end. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. I have a question about the, the proposal of the, of the articles to the, to the the, of the papers to the journals. If they, they were being refused, it's possible to resend in another time. You mean when the paper is rejected, it could be sent yeah. to another journal? To another journal or, or to the same journal after reviewing it? Okay. So you are asking me about the publication process. Yeah. The publication process frequently involves revision and resubmission or rejection and resubmission to another journal. Uh, please don't be surprised or go into shock when I tell you that there are more than 30 or 40,000 biomedical journals. When a paper is rejected by one journal, you just submit to another one. Uh, if you keep, if you have the resilience to keep on resubmitting, your paper will eventually be accepted. Thank you. Pe pe people, are, people often tell me that uh, uh, they measure the success of a scientist by measuring their success in publication. I, I think it's far better to sec measure the success of a scientist by, their, by measuring their failure rate. Have they ever failed to submit uh, to publish a paper? If they have never failed to publish a paper, then they are successful. If they have failed to publish a paper, I think there is a problem. It means possibly that they either did not conduct good enough research or they did not have the resilience to keep on resubmitting until they got accepted. Don't look at the number of papers a scientist has. Look at the number of papers they have in their hard disk not published. But I'm not sure this is a the success that way. <laughs> I'm not sure this is a public information. <laughs> well, this is the point. If you do research and don't publish it, this is not honesty. A problem about this is that uh, maybe some journals are neither interested in publishing uh, back results. So when you are uh, doing a, a PhD program, uh, for instance, your main goal is obtaining uh, some, some publication. So this is, sometimes this is not easy to handle. Mm -hmm. But look, because um, at the end of the day, someone wants to to publish. Well, look, I, I'm going to make a couple of comments. I am not saying getting published is easy, but I think if you are persistent, you will get published. That I can guarantee you. Okay, the second thing is not to publish is in my opinion, very problematic. There is something wrong if you're not prepared to publish. So I think even institutions are now taking this idea forward. And for example, PhD thesis are now made available by universities on e-repositories. The idea is that when research is undertaken, 
it should be made available in some format publicly. A PhD thesis is frequently examined, often examined, sorry, frequently examined in a form more difficult than peer review in a journal. In this case, the content of a peer reviewed, examined PhD should be not valued lower than a published journal. So e-thesis and e-repositories are a very good positive step forward in my opinion for making undertaken research available. And I believe almost all departments where I have worked through over the years encourage all their PhD students to uh, publish their work. So I, I think the, the movement is in the correct direction. I think I bring my presentation to an end. I'd like to thank you all for uh, st staying with me all this time. I, I am available for any comment, question, or uh, contact for discussion of any kind related to my presentation or research in general via my email or even my social media accounts. Uh, I have a YouTube channel, for example, where I hope this video will be uploaded with permission of the school. Uh, and I encourage you to engage with uh, your colleagues in your group, plus with your other teachers and uh, with, uh, with me, if you feel that's helpful to take forward the ideas I have discussed here and other ideas that you have that perhaps have not been covered or not been discussed today. If you have any last minute comments for me, including any comments about how I could have delivered the teaching session better, I would be very happy to aim to improve how I present my ideas in teaching in, in the future. I hope you have benefited. I personally want to share with you my, my feedback. Please and do. I sincerely, I really appreciated this lesson because it was really focused on the, on the topic and, uh, <clears throat> and also interactive. So it was a very good uh, lesson. Thank you very much for your time and for the time spent with us. Well, thank you for your questions. I sometimes end up in a teaching session where colleagues who are in the session uh, are shy, quiet, or reserved, or culturally come from a background where they don't speak much. But I'm delighted that you made some points and helped me make my educational points stronger through your comments. But for us, it's not so easy because not all of us are coming from the medical uh, point and for some of us the topic is quite new so we need to 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 take time to uh, make ours this kind of teachings so uh, it's important for us look okay. when i say that i'm available to discuss any issue that i've explained not well this is a genuine invitation so please feel free to contact me. Okay, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for my sales. Well, thank, thank you. you. And I also would like to thank uh, Ruben and Danielle and Ankel who have also sent me positive remarks in the chat. Thank you, Pro Professor Khalid for this magnificent session and well or organized and well known. Uh, it was my pleasure to be with uh, all of my colleagues and the participants. And well, thank you for your ability, your time, and thank you for everything. 
but thank you for inviting me okay bye bye thank you oh, take care <laughs>